Okay, what we're going to do now is um, move forward, obviously, but we're going to talk more about uh, combustion. We're talking about, prior to this, we talked about biofuels, we talked about fossil fuels, we talked about combustion, but we didn't go into combustion in any great detail. Um, and so now we're just going to focus on um, combustion in a lot more detail, and further on in our lessons you'll see how we actually work out entropy of combustion. So it's one of the most important equations, if you haven't worked that out um, already, um, in all the chemistry stuff that we're going to be doing, um, because we're doing it all the time. All right, combustion. So we talk about combustion being a thermochemical equation. Thermo meaning it involves, haven't worked it out already, if you haven't worked that one out, it is heat. And we've already talked about uh, entropy, and we've talked about delta H already. Um, in our previous part of the course when we did the industrial section. Here is a thermochemical equation and I wanted to highlight how you write thermochemical equations because they normally work full marks um, if you were asked to write a thermochemical equation. And there are a couple of things that you have to do every time that you do the equation and we'll tick these off to make sure we've done it right for mark. First thing is, you have to make sure that you get the correct formula for all the chemicals. Okay, that's a given. So here we've got octane, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and hopefully you can get water right by the time you get to year 12. So the correct formula is important. The next thing you have to do is you've obviously got to balance the equation in terms of number of atoms on left and right hand side of the equation. So we've got eight carbons here, we've got eight carbons here. We've got, what have we got, 18 hydrogens. We've got 19 hydrogens here on the right-hand side. That's a given, okay? Third thing is, you've got to include the state, whether it's solid or liquid or the gas, uh, for all the chemicals that you are using. I think in your textbook they use that as a gas. That's octane. Last I saw octane, it was a liquid. So you might need to just check that that is actually a liquid. Obviously, uh, if we're talking about butane, if we do the same equation, that means it would be a gas. Propane would be a gas. Um, ethane, methane, that'd be all gases. So whatever they are at room temperature, the natural state. So I know that octane's liquid, oxygen's gas, carbon dioxide is gas, and water is going to be liquid as a production of combustion in this instance. And the fourth thing is, you have to show um, the sign, and if you know it, uh, the, the value of delta H. All combustion reactions, I'll say it again, all combustion reactions are going to be exothermic. There's no combustion reactions I know of that are endothermic. Mm, no, there is. Okay. So all combustion reactions are going to release heat, but of course on different levels. The last thing, and it's not written here anywhere, but I'm going to actually check in number five, okay, and it relates to the molar or the standard entropy of combustion. So if we ever see an equation and it's written like this, kilojoules per mole, okay, the most important thing is that it's referring to one mole of the fuel. That is locked in. You notice that this, and I'll make it fairly big and obvious, that there is only one mole of octane being burnt for this reaction. So in the old text it used to be called, uh, I think it was called molar entropy, and now it's called stem entropy of combustion. So if you see kilojoules per mole, okay, it's in reference to one mole of fuel being burnt, okay, in oxygen, under normal conditions, normal states, etc. So that's really important that when you balance an equation like that, you don't touch the number in front of the fuel. It's always going to be one mole of fuel per reaction. All right, combustion. So there's combustion and there's combustion. Probably doesn't make any sense, all right, right now. But if you've ever, um, you know, poked a fire or tried to start a fire, you know there are certain things you need for combustion um, and certain concentrations that you need to have optimal combustion. 
If you haven't worked it out, number one, you need a fuel. Okay? Number two, you need a sustainable or a certain quantity of oxygen is the second thing you need for combustion. And the third thing is you need to have some form of, I'm waiting for it, yeah, ignition. Okay, good. Excellent. The invisible student in the corner got that right. Okay, so we need ignition, we need fuel, and we need oxygen for combustion. Okay? All these equations assume we've got some ignition in them already, that the combustion started. Now, the point about this is that there's three, three, three levels of combustion that we want to talk about. There is something called complete combustion. That's when we've got heaps of oxygen, like we've got an excess of oxygen. Incomplete is where the oxygen level has reduced slightly. Okay? So this could be when you're trying to get a fire started, for example, and you're waving a, you know, a, a hat or something next to it because you want to increase the flow of air, oxygen, around the fire to get it burning. And so you've all done it, probably not aware about what you were doing. What you were trying to do was to go from incomplete combustion to complete combustion. We're trying to get it to burn efficiently, okay? And that was increasing the quantity of oxygen. So, we've got incomplete where the level of oxygen goes down. Now, for complete combustion, you will notice that we end up with carbon dioxide as the product in complete combustion. Then we have incomplete, and you will notice that once we reduce the level of CO2, but sort of reduce the level of oxygen, we get carbon monoxide produced. And we'll talk about carbon dioxide again in a minute because it's pretty nasty stuff. If I really, really reduce things and, and take the level of CO2 down as far as what I can, I end up with not any carbon dioxide produced at all, actually. I end up with something called soot. And if you've ever taken a candle and uh, towards a candle where it's burning, put a plate towards the top of the candle, and you need, you'll see the candle, the candle will it'll begin to burn and it will start to go black. Take it away, it'll burn clean. Put the, the plate next to it, it'll start to burn black. Or if you've ever actually done oxyacetylene, you turn the acetylene on, and you're burning acetylene with the minimum oxygen, you'll see this carbon coming out of the acetylene torch, okay? And it actually falls, you'll see it. It's, it's really thick carbon, and the carbon is actually called soot. It's pretty nasty stuff. So we've got three levels of combustion, and it's interesting also, funny enough, you get the most energy if you've got combustion burning, or combustion is burning, at the most efficient level. With the maximum amount of oxygen, you get the most amount of heat. Okay? And as you reduce the oxygen, so we're going from about 5460 kilojoules to 280, uh, 2842, down to 1970. Okay? So as we reduce the level of oxygen down, obviously we get less heat because we're not actually breaking. Um, all of the bonds to release energy. So that's actually what's happening. Now, a couple of things we have to go back and look at, and it's mainly in, release in, in relation to the incomplete and the total incomplete combustion. This is all we know about CO2, you know, greenhouse effect, that sort of stuff, we've done it already. But this one here is really dangerous. Um, and the reason why it's dangerous is carbon monoxide has got the same shape as an oxygen molecule. And so the problem that we have with carbon monoxide is that HP is hemoglobin, and you would have seen this equation in the section maybe on equilibrium. So hemoglobin works great with oxygen, it absorbs oxygen, okay, but this is an equilibrium reaction. So if I've got carbon monoxide anywhere that I'm inhaling, the carbon dioxide as concentration CO2, C, CO goes up, you notice that it attracts to the carbon monoxide on the hemoglobin. In other words, it swaps. It pushes the oxygen out and replaces it with carbon monoxide. So I end up releasing oxygen from my cells in my body. That's not good, because I need to have oxygen to carry out respiration. Fairly obvious. The problem is that this equilibrium reaction, okay, tells me that the more CO that I inhale, the more oxygen I'm expelling. That ultimately means, over time, and not very much I might add, two or three lungfuls of carbon monoxide, 
you begin to get drowsy, which is natural, okay? Some of you are probably doing that now. But anyway, so the carbon monoxide that we're inhaling is going to put us to sleep. And if you don't actually remove yourself from the source of carbon monoxide, as happened and will continue to happen, no doubt, people actually die, okay? They go to sleep and they don't wake up. Because there's no, there's nothing in your body that says, oh, carbon monoxide uh, increased my respiration rate, breathe quicker. Whereas the, the initiation or the stimulus for breathing, you have to remember if you've done some biology, is carbon dioxide. So a body can react to carbon dioxide, so I've got lots of carbon dioxide built up in my blood, then I'm going to increase my respiration rate to increase the oxygen to get the CO2 out. So that's the stimulus to obviously increase the O2. But carbon monoxide, I can be sitting here right now, standing here right now, breathing in carbon monoxide and gradually going to sleep and my respiration doesn't change, nothing changes, I get sleepy and eventually the ground okay and the nasty thing about it is that people do this so they start up a car in the shed for example or a motorbike in a closed environment they don't even know that they're doing it maybe because they didn't have a very good chemistry teacher but the shed's closed the windows are closed so the CO2 builds the CO builds up carbon monoxide builds up um, and in a very short period of time uh, they find themselves unconscious and that's it um, and it happens and it's happened many times before and I won't include that in the video, but there's many stories if you look back in, in um, newspaper articles about people that have died because they haven't actually understood how lethal carbon monoxide is. All right. If you've got lung problems, um, the next thing we're going to look at is total incomplete combustion. And with the current uh, COVID situation, it's probably not too bad at the moment, uh, because we haven't got so much... Uh, fuel being burnt, particularly, mainly in this instance, if you remember what we talked about before, diesel's a big problem for incomplete combustion because it's a longer carbon chain. It needs more oxygen to burn. So, if we get soot in the atmosphere, it's like when I had the, uh, the oxyacetylene flame, if, if you can imagine that, I'm holding this and there's black flame, black soot's coming out from the flame. That soot goes into the atmosphere. If I'm near that, if I'm walking down the road and a diesel truck comes past um, and it's blowing out black smoke and I inhale that, I get the carbon particles in my lung. So what that means is that I, if I'm an asthmatic, I could have an asthma attack. It can lead to um, heart problems. Uh, it's, it can build up in your, in your blood, etc. But lots and lots of health effects. Um, and my um, respiratory tract becomes infected because of the mucus. We're trying to get rid of it, basically, that, that particle. And that's what we do naturally anyway. But we do have to build up with mucus. So the health problems are significant with increased levels of carbon. Greenhouse effect. So what happens is the carbon goes into the atmosphere, okay, and it rises with the, um, what's that called, the um, thermal stuff, whatever that's called, the, um, as the heat rises. It's got a name, and you can work that one out. All right, so the soot particles take up in the atmosphere. The problem is that they form a, uh, a seed for condensation of water. So the water that's in the clouds, uh, well, it's not there, but the water in the atmosphere tends to, uh, condense on the soot particles, water we know absorbs heat the worst, or the most I should say, leading to a worst impact. So the water is absorbing or being attracted towards the, the actual the soot particle. All the soot particles are surrounded by water. Infrared comes in from the sun. The water is fantastic at absorbing heat and it just basically enhances the greenhouse effect even more. So not good from that perspective. And if you look it up in your book as well, it also leads to the deformation of the leaf growth in plants, and that's going to affect photosynthesis, which would impact you know, our biofuels if we go back a few lessons as well, um, or even our, fuel, uh, uh, even our food crops um, in particular. So combustion, um, very, very important that you understand how to do your thermochemical equation, okay, and get the thermochemical equation right. If you do get it, Get the thermochemical equation, they're all the same pretty much. Um, all you've got to do is just balance them and keep that at one. Okay, so always check though that they're balanced, and of course, the different versions of combustion 
based on how much oxygen you have, CO bad, soot bad, and that's about the level of um, our combustion so far.